Hello, once again, wonderful people of YouTube land. It is your friend, Wild Elf 26 Hey, it's another yakking and snacking video. I got my snacks right here. I'll be enjoying them. I just got done playing some of my six-hold ocarina. I intend at some point to get a sweet potato-shaped version, hopefully in a slightly lighter blue. <laughs> and, uh... I don't know if I'll just stick with a 6-hole or maybe go to a 12-hole, but so far I'm having a hard time mastering the 6-hole ocarina. Alrighty guys, uh, I just want to preface this. We're going to be doing some gameplay in our yakking and snacking video on the NES. Uh, this is an official NES controller. It's a later release one called the Dogbone. It's quite comfortable. This is a third-party one for the classics. Uh, HD, uh, Classics 2 HD from old school. Um, as you can see, it's quite ergonomic and well designed. Uh, that being said, this is a third party version from old school. You can get it um, relatively affordable, and uh, if you like playing NES, that controller is much more forgivable on your hands than the rectangle of death known as the original NES controller. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to point out a couple things uh, real quick. Uh, I recently had to block or hide some users. Uh, I got on a Zelda site and I made some statements, my true opinions. Uh, I am a fan of Zelda, but I am not a fanboy. Fanboy are, are like zealots. They won't listen to reason. Whatever the franchise puts out, they'll just buy it and say it's great, no matter what kind of steaming brown turd it actually is. And uh, I bring that up because I love Zelda 1 for the NES. I love Zelda 2, The Adventures of Link for the NES. And it's a connection to the cartoon for, that was on the uh, Super Mario Brothers Super Show. Uh, Legend of Zelda, where he says, excuse me, princess. Love that tagline. <clears throat> and uh, that being said, the first two NES Zeldas, gold. Great. Uh, first one, the original, is, is an overhead, top overhead view. Second one, Z Zelda 2, they advanced. They did a side scroller. Um, it was awesome. Uh, the Game Boy version came out, and the Game Boy has extreme 8-bit limitations. So when it was a top head overview, I forgave it because it has it's a limited console. It really is uh, four shades of green and black uh, until the DX version later. But um, so I forgave that version. I did like it. Uh, the the Ballad of the Windfish, all that um, Link's Awakening was just a beautiful game um, for what it was on the system limitations. It was. Now this is where my big gripes come in. When they finally decide, this is the premiere release of The Legend of Zelda for the very first time on the 16-bit Super Nintendo. And prior to this game being released, and I'm an OG from the, from the OG days, and uh, I was there for the week of its original release. Heck, I was there the year the NES was first released in America and advertised greatly. Uh, my memories go back that far, yes, and I was one of the few people playing it too. Uh, we can afford one when it first came out. I was over at my friend's houses a lot. Uh, but I digress. When they finally released uh, Link to the Past, uh, I was almost old enough to be on my own at that point. Uh, I was working, I had money at that point, and a magical place known as Blockbuster Video, I rented, rented, the week of its release, I rented Link to the Pass for the Super NES. And prior to that game, I'd seen 16-bit games that were fantasy related. Uh, one of them on a console and an arcade machine, King of Dragons from Capcom. Awesome game. Uh, but before that, I saw Golden Axe, and I saw the Genesis version of G 
golden axe, which is very much a, a magic and wizards and warriors and swords kind of game, and uh, and monsters. And uh, heck, they even have a character, Gilius Thunderhead. He looks like he's dressed in Link style clothing. He's a little dwarf, but he he's the one. He he carries the fabled golden axe, and it has a uh, lightning power when he gets his magics filled up. Uh, and you go around, you collect items that build your magic and your magic attacks so you can hit more enemies on screen with more uh, attack power. But these games, they, they weren't 3D, but the way they were drawn, the, the way the art was presented, that gave them almost a 3D kind of feel, uh, even with King of Dragons. And if you play King of Dragons with the elf, running through with the elf, he's an archer. He has very link lookingness to him. Uh, it's very easy to, with both of these games, to envision a Legend of Zelda game showing up kind of like this, looking kind of this way, one of those games or the other. So when the Super NES uh, company finally decided they're going to make Legend of Zelda for the Super NES, I went to rent it. And every game, you've seen the boxes, uh, box art on the back, I looked at the screen screenshots. Now, screenshots are kind of iffy. Sometimes they show you gameplay. Sometimes they show you between gameplay or mini games or some transitionary period in the game shows up as one of the screenshots. So you're unclear exactly on what is the majority viewpoint you're going to see in this game. So I went into that with an eyebrow raised because I saw a couple of the top over, overhead views and I saw some menu screens and uh, I wasn't certain. So I, I start up this game. I see the initial screens. I notice right away they're putting things in letterbox. And uh, that makes me a little nervous because they're already squishing the image size down for letterboxing. Um, and then I see little rectangles or story screen markers. They look like early MS-DOS artwork um, or like an Apple computer thing from earlier days. And then underneath there are some texts explaining the story. And it doesn't look like special text or special wizard writing or, or even something fancy from Nintendo. It just look like, looks like regular kind of computer text. And just the rectangles and uh, stationary art bits that were being showed at each rectangle. And nothing was very wowing. There was no wow factor. Wowie zowie, there was no wow factor. Um, so I was getting nervous at this point and then finally uh, because the beginning of the game story screens that's where you're supposed to wow you with the artwork and if you don't believe me you play Wanderers from Wise 3 on the Super NES look at all the beginning story screens before you begin any actual gameplay compare that to, to Zelda compare how much effort went into Wanderers from Wise 3 versus what they did with Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. You can see. And then I finally get to play. Final gameplay. Okay, it's starting. And you're in the house of his uncle. And I'm immediately depressed. Uh, it's the smallest sprites I've ever seen in a 16-bit game. And worse, it's, it's a viewpoint presentation. It, this game looks like with a few tweaks, a few hack tweaks... It could easily be ported as a regular 8-bit NES game. Um, there's some orchestral music kind of thrown in at different points. That's becoming the trademark of most SNES games. Uh, ActRaiser has a lot of orchestra. So does uh, Castlevania. Uh, so we're hearing this this like orchestra stuff, and there's a little bit of that in Metroid. Uh, for Super NES 2. And so the music is kind of impressive, but nothing else is at this point. Nothing. It's a thunderstorm. You're in your uncle's house. And then I see Link and and his hair color, it's, it stands out from the game. Not because it stands out because of the color. It stands out because that color is out of place on Link. Link has brown hair or light sandy brown hair. And, and brown eyes. He never has pink hair. And in Super NES, for some dumb dumb reason, 
they chose to give him pink hair and right right there that was like uh, uh, I, I was getting pissed you know you know how you get you get at a point when a game is like beating you unfair on some level and something some people actually throw their controllers or, or snap them or stuff I was getting like angry like that kind of angry and uh, remember I had just rented I rented this game I did not buy it I did not pay the ridiculous amount to purchase this game outright brand new and I'm ranting and rambling right now, but that's okay because this is a yakking and snacking video. Um, and I'll be taking part in those snacks in a minute. Uh, so, we begin the gameplay, and it's like original Zelda all over again with slightly more detailed graphics. Um, and to give you an idea of how small Link in Super NES Zelda is, remember Super Mario World? Remember Mario after he gets a marsh after he gets a mushroom and after he gets the yellow cape the little feather that gives him the yellow cape compare that sprite side by side with the sprite of Link from Link to the Past Mario will be noticeably larger he's larger um So yeah tiniest sprites I've ever seen on a 16 bit game and uh it did not look anything close to my uh, Golden Axe or, or King of Dragons expectations. Uh, heck, even Wanders from Wise was uh, whipping it. And I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that Nintendo had pulled that on us. Uh, I, I don't think they understand that, that you have greater technology in this machine. The, the game should reflect... The better technology and it really didn't aside from the music i know there's going to be people yelling about the music uh and like i said i'm i'm not a fan boy i'm a fan of good nintendo games of good retro games sega any company um i definitely like a big chunk of the the legend of zelda games but not the super nes legend of zelda it's terrible it's horrible it's a brown steaming pile of crap. And uh, all the people that keep saying how great it is, no, it's not. It's not even close to great. It's a waste of your time, a waste of your money. Uh, it's a waste of your Zelda fandom. And uh, thank goodness that with the N64 that uh, Zelda Ocarina of Time finally came around. Uh, excellent game. Uh, Link actually becomes an adult at part of the game. Uh, to finish the the last half of the game um, it's an excellent Zelda game all around a uh, lot, lot of re-exploration it's just a tremendous wonderment and joy to play Ocarina of Time as opposed to uh, the overhyped and I'm gonna say it overhyped because I was looking forward to it and then I played it and then I found out about it Majora's Mask Horribly overhyped. There, there is a timer that clocks down, and you have to achieve certain things, and then you have to go through a ludicrous process just to save. And by the way, the save menu thing from Majora's Mask compared to regular Ocarina Time, it's ridiculous. You have to confirm, identify, confirm like six times in a row before it actually saves, which means you spent probably. Oh, if you're really fast with it, probably 13 seconds of, of stuff just to get a save to occur. Uh, 13 Mississippis counted slow. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. 13 Mississippis to save every time you attend to save the game. And uh, there's a big period where you're not protected for saving. And when the when the timer goes out, suddenly a bunch of stuff you just accomplished, poof, it's gone. And it goes all the way back to your previous save. And that is, it, it's stressful as heck, beyond stressful. Uh, challenging gameplay is one thing. That's good. You know, something's a challenge. But this is not challenging. This is stressful. This game was designed to be infinitely stressful 
and Nintendo tends to target a demographic. The, the standard Nintendo demographic, they don't like 18 year olds and up playing their games. They don't, that's not who they're targeting. They're targeting six year olds, six year old gamers. That is the demographic of Nintendo primarily. I think they started to get better about this around the time Twilight Princess came out and uh, their attempt with Skyward Sword and uh, and these Breath of the Wild uh, Breath of the Wild uh, uh, centric games that they got currently, uh, they're reflecting more of a targeting of 17 and 21 year olds now. But before Breath of the Wild, I swear Nintendo's entire demographic policy was six year olds. Will six year olds love it? That's all they cared about. Uh, they seem to have some preconceived notion that the families of the six-year-olds will constantly pay ridiculous money upon ridiculous money for the Pokemon card games, for the newest Mario and Mario Maker. Um, they, they totally were, were ignoring, ignoring the fact that young adults who were teenagers who are now adults are paying bonzo money for this, this stuff. And... Uh, it was reflected in their ads. And that's another thing, too, speaking of advertisements. And they were misleading when the Super NES came out. There was a lot of different commercials for the Super NES Legend of Zelda. Not in any of those commercials did they ever show one of the actors depicted as Link ever having pink hair. They had one guy, he had sandy, kind of blondish hair in the American commercial. Uh, in the Japanese commercial, which is kind of hilarious... And this is early 90s, like it's barely in the 90s. Um, they got this kid, he's, he's doing like a, a hip-hop dance and a pop and lock for, for The Legend of Zelda. And he's dressed up like Zelda. Uh, costume isn't too much separate, uh, different from what you see here. Um, and he's got brown hair. He's definitely Japanese. And um, yeah, not, not any indication of a pink hair thing. I think that they had developed most of the game with Zelda having dark brown hair. And then at some point, almost upon the release, for whatever reason, somebody with influence in the dev team decided, hey, let's go with pink hair. And they just gave him pink hair. Like, yeah, we don't give a crap. What are the fans like? What have we been doing with them? Let's give them pink hair and not say anything about it, not put it in the booklet. Uh, not, not say anything in the booklet about his pink hair, you know. Uh, we might have artwork, uh, screenshots, explaining stuff in the booklet that will show him, you know, obviously with pink hair. Uh, but we're just going to put it out there. Yeah, pink hair. Yeah, why not? Just, just, they didn't care. They, they just didn't care. Um, even now when they re remade it, reboot of Link's Awakening for Nintendo Switch, it starts out, uh, the opening intro screen is anime. It's anime, and, and Link looks like an adult. He looks like 17 or 18 or something years old. And he's, he's in that storm, and he's trying to get through it. But there he is, and he's a freaking... Uh, uh, they go from that to this little chibi toy looking thing that's supposed to be Link in the game and that's what he looks like folks that, that style of Japanese style that, that I can't stand it's the one Japanese style I can't stand chibi uh, I like Sailor Moon but I can't stand chibi usa uh, and and they do they do look like chibi toys in the Link's Awakening remake and now subsequently Link to the Past remake they're doing that same style which you know um it just looks terrible. Remember those dolls that they used to advertise a lot here in America? Uh, precious moments. It looks like an extra, extra younger, goofier looking precious moments. And uh, yes, I, I just don't understand Nintendo when it comes to this franchise. It, it, to me, it's a franchise that gets probably the least respect in the uh, uh, Nintendo family of products. Um, 
they give Zelda, I mean, not Zelda, they give uh, Metroid a lot of respect. Uh, Samus always comes off looking like a badass, you know, she, she's a female hero. She's a female hero that's been a female hero since the 1980s and been a badass since the 1980s before all this woke agenda, whatever stuff was ever a thing. Um, but Nintendo's always been respectful and they've upgraded Samus at every turn. Uh, the Metroid Prime games are awesome. Metroid Zero Suit Samus, also awesome. Has kind of that Zentai fun effect, you know. And, uh, you know, I love cosplay. Uh, hell, I like crossplay too. I like uh, Zentai. Uh, heck, I like the, the Kigirumi. If you like Kigirumi, I love Kigirumi too. It's, it's awesome. Uh, the stuff they have for Kigirumi is ridiculously wild, cool, uh, pretty pricey, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it's awesome. And um, basically, if, if you can enjoy it at a Comic-Con event, a sci-fi con or something, <clears throat> more power to you. Uh, embrace our freedoms. Uh, YouTube is the freest of the social medias. That's, that's why I like YouTube. YouTube helps protect our freedoms of speech. Uh, I get a little eyebrow raising anytime they start about any, any talk about restrictiveness or more restrictiveness. No, YouTube, embrace the freedoms. It's what separates you from some of the social medias. It's what makes you the best of the social medias in the self's opinion. So, um, yeah, to me, YouTube's the best. You don't see me on the other social medias currently at the moment. I'm here in Florida right now and uh, enjoying my freedoms, my freedom of speech. And I'm glad YouTube helps me enjoy them too. Um, and I hope they continue to do that. Uh, ho hopefully they'll redo a few of their policies, make things more freedom of speech minded, uh, at least for the uh, American division of YouTube. Um, so anyway, guys, like I say, it's a yakking and snacking video. The gameplay will await us shortly. I have to jump from one gimbal, this position, uh, to another. <clears throat> I don't know if you could even see my face um, in, in all that yakking and uh, squawking I was just doing. Uh, the frame was a little weird last time I started the video. Uh, I'm going to make the gimbal jump. Get some snacks. Yeah. I wonder what snack this is. Shaped like a triangle. Hmm. I wonder what snack that could possibly be. Hmm. A darn tasty snack. That's what I'll say. By the way, guys. If you know me, and I've been doing YouTube over three years now, <clears throat> you'll never get vulgar words or F-bombs or any of that stuff. I'm very commercial friendly to any potential supporters, advertisers, whatever out there. <clears throat> I'm not monetized, and uh, I guess I probably won't be until I start a second channel at some point. But I've been airwave appropriate, with no vulgar words, no slurs, not even any uh, vulgar uh, finger gestures, <laughs> self-censoring, not that I like censoring at all, mind you, but I can behave within the confounds of censoring to reasonable limits. All right, guys, I know I'm simply getting you frustrated as heck waiting for this footage. So hold on, let me jump the gimbal. Hmm, 
That sounds like code for something. <laughs> All right, guys. Jump in the gimbal. Because it's so good. Hold on a minute. There's a second part of this gimbal jumping. Hold on, hold on. Not quite there yet. I don't know what the temperature is where you guys are, but it's summer, or the beginning of summer, and wonderful Central Florida. Saw birds walking around yesterday with their little beaks open. They were so overheated. Okay, okay. I almost got this. I gotta get this gimbal just right. Because I basically have to watch this game footage. And there was a trick I used to do with a sunglass. I would pop out a lens of a sunglass and put it over the camera. And it would actually help. Okay, we're going to get some footage here. This game is for the NES. This was made in 1989. And it's called, it's from Capcom, it's for the NES, it's called Codename Viper. Codename Viper. Here, we're going to let the demo play a little. that demo go again. The gimbal is kind of awkward so I gotta be careful here. If you look at those graphics in this demo, you'll notice that Capcom went for realism as best they could with the NES. The animation frames are superb. He just saved that woman hostage. Um, the animation frames are superb. The hero character is actually wearing kind of Zelda Link colors. But you can tell, even on this 8-bit machine, they were able to make an actual sizable sprite. can stabilize the gimbal we'll have us some footage here it's kind of hard to do that so hold on I'm doing I'm giving her all she's got captain hold on yeah. Yeah. I sound like Kayan from what's that fighting game uh, Toshiden yeah, Battle Arena Toshiden. Okay. Start. Normal. See how far we're getting this gameplay footage here. There's the story. Meeting his boss. Remember, guys, you can uh, screenshot any of the text and then read it later off your uh, phone device or whatnot.
Rescued one hostage. Oh, I got some ammo. Ammo. Rescued a little boy. That's cool. They've got different hostages, so that's some good designing. Machine gun, okay. Oh. Starts me way back there. Hold on a minute, folks. Oh, they randomized the hostages. It's not the same spot that I rescued the other one. Sorry guys, this is awkward from where I'm at. Okay. Trying to get a better angle, but Ultimately, it's giving me a lot of problem here. Uh, I had a good gimbal a few months back and I don't have it anymore. So what I'm using is kind of a replacement gimbal. But... Uh, there we go. If it'll hold. Codename Viper, people. Codename Viper from Capcom's 1989 yakking and snacking video, folks. Sorry, the gimbal's doing that thing again. <sighs> I'm sorry, folks. I had this video planned out a lot better than this, I thought.
machine gun. Give me a second, and I'll see if I can make it to that second level. <laughs> and after that, I'll have to grab another handful of snack. It's like trying to ride a mechanical bull and get news footage at the same time. The ones in blue take two shots to take them down. The ones in gray go down in only one shot. Jumps are precise and unforgiving. Ah. Well, we'll revisit this game at some point. Right now, I'm kind of going on fumes. I apologize, folks. I'm not this rusty at the game, but I'm a little bit of ex exhausted. I didn't get a whole lot of sleep last night. Alrighty, folks. Uh, that is Codename Viper. And this was my gameplay footage, yakking and snacking video. For 1989 Capcom Codename Viper. Uh, I hope you guys had some interesting musings, uh, what you thought of the graphics in general, and um, what you thought of the uh, uh, fluidness of the game. Remember, it was it's running on Nintendo hardware, not on. Uh, it's not a 16-bit title. It's an 8-bit title. Um, but even it, I feel even even Codename Viper feels like it would have been more at place on a 16-bit machine than it would be on an 8-bit machine. Uh, kind of the reverse of what Zelda Link to the Past is. Uh, Link to the Past is a 8-bit game. It just it just has all the feelings of an 8-bit game. Uh, none of the benefits of a 16-bit game except for the music. Yes, it's got some decent music. But decent music is not the only criteria for a good Zelda game. And uh, the fanboys need to know that. Uh, not that they'll accept that, because fanboys are self, basically brainwashed. Uh, that, that company, that franchise can do no wrong. We must buy, buy, pay more money, buy, buy, buy. You know. All right, guys, you have a great one. Uh, Wild Elf 26 trying to bring some common sense or no 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 some good sense back to the table in regards to certain franchises of retro gaming uh, if you agree hey let me know in the comments if you disagree 
well, speak your mind. I'm willing to hear you out. Uh, we keep it somewhat respectful. Um, and uh, if you should feel like it, press the like button. Uh, if there was something interesting there, share it with uh, one of your friends uh, by using the share option, uh, the YouTube share op option. Uh, and if it was something kind of prolific, if you enjoyed it, if, if, if the spirit moves you to do so, if you feel like it, subscribe. Yeah, uh, that, that could definitely help things out. It can help out the channel. And if you open subscribe, your name will appear and I can add it to the list next time I'm doing some subscriber shout outs. Always wait till I got about eh, five subscribers new, maybe six subscribers, and then I do a shout out video. All right, guys, you have a great one. Wild Elf 26. Enjoy your retro games and uh, don't feel uh, uh, shy. Speak your mind. If you have an opinion that differs about a popular game, go right ahead and talk about it. Let people know. Don't, don't let the uh, fanboys uh, uh, silence your opinions. All right, guys. Have a great one. And enjoy your retro gaming. And may the Triforce bless you all.